welcome again. My name is Dimitri with Sense Financial Services. And uh, today we joined by uh, Paul from Wellings Capital to talk about this uh, topic, how to profit by investing in RV parks and mobile home parks. Uh, Paul is uh, uh, actually a good friend of mine. He's the author, real estate developer, investor, and educator. Uh, he wrote two books on uh, real estate investing, and uh, he's actually working on another one, uh, which is uh, Warren Buffett Rules for Real Estate Investors. I'm excited uh, to see when that when, when it comes out. He actually um, done over 125 real estate investments since 2000. Uh, he's a real estate developer and featured uh, on HDTV. Uh, he co-founded, uh, developed and operated a number of commercial projects, including a Hyatt Hotel, a multifamily assets and waterfront subdivisions. Uh, he actually built and sold the HR outsourcing firm. Uh, he co-hosts the show How to Lose Money, um, which is a well-building podcast. He's a blogger uh, on the live show of Bigger Pockets. He's a, a founder of the nonprofit organization. And uh, he's a family man, married with, uh, for 35 years with uh, four children. Uh, and Paul, uh, I... Well, actually, I learned about uh, Paul uh, through Bigger Pockets, which is, um, uh, for those of you who don't know, is a great uh, um, number one uh, networking uh, uh, site for real estate investors with millions of uh, uh, members and uh, it's just a great resource. I met uh, many, many friends there. We actually acquired over 700 clients from bigger pockets and I met Paul there. So, um, and uh, how I met Paul is uh, basically I started investing uh, almost 20 years ago. And my experience was in uh, just uh, single family rentals. And when I started this business, I wanted to diversify. And so I started doing private lending, started investing in um, multifamily uh, syndications. But several years ago, I, uh, wanted to uh, have a little bit more diversification. And so that's when I uh, found Paul, we connected and uh, I was, uh, I invested in a couple of his funds and uh, uh, it just uh, added great uh, uh, dimension to my portfolio. And uh, uh, Paul, uh, welcome. Thanks for, uh, for your willingness to come and join us and present and educate people. Cause I think, most uh, people just like uh, uh, myself uh, uh, looking at the what's coming or what's coming in the in this uncertain time so uh, i think paul can provide great value so paul go ahead and take it over dimitri thank you so much it's such an honor to be here with you i thank you so much for giving us uh, an hour of your thursday evening it's it's really an honor and a pleasure to be here uh, we're not going to be talking about investments. I mean, investments with our company this evening, but uh, our investments are for accredited investors only. Uh, we have PPMs. Uh, we, um, we are not tax or legal advisors. Uh, Wellings Capital doesn't have a direct affiliation with Sense Financial. And we recommend that you always get tax or legal advice. So that's out of the way. What's Jeff Bezos doing on my screen? He's not a real estate investor, is he, Dimitri? I don't think he is. Maybe he is. Um, he He's kind of a funny guy. Jeff Bezos went around reportedly to all the vending machines and Amazon offices and warehouses and facilities, and he took the light bulbs out of the vending machines. Now, why would he do that? Well, he figured, why waste the money on electricity to advertise land snacks? Why do I have to have a maintenance person who has to go in and change the light bulb out and pay for the light bulb? Bezos knows the power of one dollar. Bezos knows that a dollar saved per month translates to $12 a year. I, you knew I was good at math, right, Dimitri? $12 a year. But they have something called a price to earnings ratio. And anybody who's invested in stocks knows about this. Well. Amazon's price to earnings ratio has been 100 to 120 
on average for about five years. So $12 saved per year translates to about $1,200 to $1,440 in increased value of his stocks and the stocks of his shareholders. So it's a very, very powerful formula. Well, in real estate investing, you've got, you know, Dimitri and I both started, we invest in single family houses. A lot of you probably done that. Well, the value of a single family house is based on comps, but the value of commercial real estate is based on math. And that math formula is very similar to the PE ratio. It's kind of the opposite in a way. The value in commercial real estate is uh, the value equals the net operating income divided by the cap rate. And a cap rate, you know, typically is something like four, five, six, seven percent. So, you know, 0 0.06 is what I'm using for six percent here. So, this is why we believe most of the Forbes 400, probably Bezos too, invest in commercial real estate because a dollar a month out of the bottom line translates to $12 annually. 12 divided by 0 0.06 is $200 increase in asset value. That's pretty powerful from a $1 added to the bottom line per month. But when you use leverage, it increases that even more. So here's that visually. And this is what I love, and this is what Dimitri loves about commercial real estate. You can take a dollar of income, $12 a year, divide that by 0 0.06, create $200 in asset value, leverage that at you know normal leverage rate of let's say 66%, and that creates a 3x value on the equity. So a 10% increase in asset value could translate to a 30% increase in your equity. And so here, here are some examples of how this translates. So I'm going to do a few of the, the math on a few of these, and then you can do your own if you want. So um, apartments, we bought a 125 unit apartment building in Kentucky. We, by filling 15 vacant apartments at 825 a unit, that translates to $12,375 a month. That's $148,500 per year. Now you take that net operating income, 148, divided by 0 0.06, that's a $2.4 million increase in property value. That's quite powerful. I mean, that was about an $8 million apartment building. And so by adding 2.4 million to it, just by filling 15 vacant apartments, that's creating real wealth. Uh, another thing we did at that apartment building is we passed the water bills back to the tenants on 125 units. That was at $25 a month, more or less. That's $43.75 per month. That's about $52,000 per year. That added another $875,000 to the value of the complex. Now let's move over to mobile home parks. Let's say you could raise lot rent a lot of mobile home parks are significantly uh, renting significantly below value because they're typically mom and pop run. Sometimes they're hundreds of dollars below market. Well, if you go to one and you have a $300 lot rent, you raise it by only 5%, $15 a month across 300 spaces, that's a nine, it translates to a $900,000 increase in value of that park. Uh, or you can negotiate a cable and internet deal. That's a $625,000 increase in value. Uh, you could uh, pay, you could add paid outdoor storage. Uh, a mobile home park I know of. Uh, I think uh, we invested in this park years ago, and the park had about an acre out front by the road that they weren't going to put any mobile homes on. And he spent $100,000 to pave this acre, put a nice fence and a gate, and now he goes around, he went around to the tenants and he said, hey, you've got anything over two cars, it's got to go inside there. If you got a boat, you got an RV, you got a work, big work truck, you got to put it in the paid outdoor storage. Well, he's making 9,000 a month from that. 9,000 a month uh, in, from that outdoor storage, that, that translates to $1.8 million in increased value of that mobile home park, almost $2 million at 6% cap rate. 
Let's go over it self storage. You can add U haul to self storage. You can make anywhere from $1,000 to $14,000 a month, from what I've heard. $3,000 a month, though, would be $36,000 a year. $36,000 a year divided by a 6% cap rate translates to $600,000 in increased value. So there's other things you can do. The point of all this is commercial real estate is a powerful value generator. And I wanted to start with this. And I wanted to start by talking about intrinsic value to give you a baseline to think <clears throat> about the way we think about RV parks and mobile home parks. Now, Michelangelo, most famous sculptor of all time, he said the sculpture is already complete within the marble block before I start my work. He said he could see an angel in the block. All he had to do is chisel away the superfluous material. And so he could see a commodity like this, a piece of marble block, and he could see the sculpt, he could see the artwork inside it. He could chisel it away and it could become something very valuable. A, a few hundred dollar block of marble could become a work of art in Michelangelo's hands. And that's the way we like to invest in commercial real estate. We like to partner with operators who know how to find that intrinsic value. And if you hang on to the end, I'm gonna wrap up this presentation later by telling you one of the very best ways to locate and to extract intrinsic value. So who's investing in mobile home parks? Blackstone, uh, mobile home parks used to be, look, you know, everybody looked down their nose at mobile homes and mobile home parks. Maybe you did, I know I did. Blackstone's in, they're in for a couple billion dollars now. Sam Zell, the number one real estate investor in America, possibly the world, he has um, he's invested in mobile home parks since the late 1960s. And he is a billionaire investing in mobile home parks and other asset types. He's got 158,000 mobile home park pads, last I checked. Uh, Warren Buffett got involved in Clayton Homes, and he also has a mortgage finance company for mobile homes. So. Dimitri, when you and I met in LA a number of years ago, I was a multifamily syndicator and that's all I planned to do. But we found it compelling to expand into mobile home parks, self-storage, um, uh, uh, RV parks, and other asset types. And so tonight we're gonna talk about why, why we love these two asset types in particular, let's start with manufactured housing communities, which is a nice word for mobile home parks. Um, first of all, they're recession resistant. They're steady in all cycles. Uh, there's a shrinking supply of mobile home parks. It's the only asset class we know of, asset type we know of that has a shrinking supply and an increasing demand every year. There really is an affordable housing crisis. Dimitri, did you know that 10,000 people turned 65 today? But six in 10 didn't have $10,000 saved for retirement. Some of them have some equity in their home, and many of them will choose a mobile home park lifestyle. Just uh, a few hours east of you, a successful California doctor that I know actually traded in his house near the beach for a, um, he, he traded uh, his house in for a mobile home in a mobile home park. And now he travels a lot. He's not poor at all. He's a retired, successful doctor. Um, one of the things we love about mobile home parks is they have very high switching costs. Uh, tenants typically don't leave. They typically stay for 13 to 15 years from the studies I've seen. Uh, they're fragmented. There's a lot of mom and pop owners, which is where you can extract a lot of intrinsic value. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, you can, uh, the, the there are very low maintenance and capital expenses, which might surprise you if you've ever owned and rented out a mobile home. I rented, I owned and rented four in my life and three were a disaster. We're not talking about renting mobile homes here though. We're talking about renting dirt, renting dirt and infrastructure, a place for people to live and creating a nice community for them to raise a family or to retire or to live their life at a far lower cost than you would get from an apartment or a single family home. In fact, look at these average rents. In California, 
two bedroom apartment, according to this data, averages $1,294. <coughs> Excuse me, manufactured housing lot rent, $534. My state, three down here, Virginia, 1,029 is the average two bedroom apartment, but you can live in a typically a three bedroom manufactured home with a yard, with a front door, with a deck, with some polyester curtains. I'm just kidding. Um, <clears throat> for a, a third of that. And so it really is a much more cost effective way for a lot of people to live and enjoy their life. It's not just people who can't afford other things, although that's that too. Um, the supply, like I mentioned earlier, Green Street shows here, if you look at this, manufactured housing, mobile home parts, zero new supply. Compare that to apartments, industrial, office, and even malls have a higher increase, have a, have a higher new supply, according to this study, than mobile home parts. So that creates a great opportunity if you're one of the 43,000 mobile home park owners that have a mobile home park now or can acquire one. Now, I mentioned capital expenses are low. Look on the right here. Manufactured housing, 3.6% of revenues. Multifamily on the left, 12.2%. So again, it goes back to the fact that we're talking about renting dirt and infrastructure. We're not talking about renting park-owned homes, though sometimes you have to do that. And we should, in fact, discuss some of the downsides. So why do we, what are some potential downsides with mobile home parks? Number one, eviction moratoriums, government regulations. There was an eviction moratorium, as you know, two and a half years ago during COVID, and it hit apartments and mobile home parks. Now, the thing that was powerful about mobile home parks is if they didn't pay their lot rent, they're probably going to lose their home because if they didn't pay, let's say there was a one-year eviction moratorium. Well, if they didn't pay, they've got a you know, $30,000, $50,000 home or maybe a $10,000 home sitting there. They don't want to lose it. So people typically paid. In fact, the collections during COVID were surprisingly good. Now, a real problem in mobile home parks is supply chain holdups. It's really hard to get new homes lately. And so that is a potential downside or a potential challenge for mobile home park owners. And again, this is where a professional owner, a professional business manager will do much better than a mom and pop. A lot of mom and pops have more park owned homes. That means they own the homes. They think, hey, I can double the rent by renting the home and the dirt. But again, professional operators don't typically um, don't typically think that way. In fact, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae loves to loan to mobile home park owners, but they don't like park owned homes. There's a negative stigma, like I mentioned earlier, to mobile home parks. The house I grew up in on the left, <clears throat> just kidding. But seriously, this is the one on the left here. That's how I viewed mobile homes. That's how I view mobile home parks. But the one on the right, I mean, that's an extreme version. But, you know, a, a lot of mobile home parks that we like to invest in look closer to the one on the right and certainly nothing like the one on the left. This is a mobile home park in Gillette, Wyoming, that we invested in through our operating partner. And uh, it's, again, it's got a lot. You can see they're almost new, all newer mobile homes. It's beautifully laid out. And it's a nice community. This is one in Lancaster, Ohio, south of Columbus that we invested in. And um, these are the type of manufactured home communities we like to invest in. So we really like mobile home parks. I wanna tell you a quick story. Now this, to be real clear, this is not indicative and it's probably not even really that fair and balanced, but uh, one of the mobile home parks we invested in was in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. We bought it in February of 2020. Uh, we we invest, we're the largest investor in it with our operating partner. We bought it for from a lady who had not been there for at least five years. It was a 311 space park. She hadn't been there in at least five years, and she sold it for $7.1 million, more than she ever dreamed she'd probably ever get for that park. Well, that was half debt, three and a half million in debt, and about 3.6 million in equity. Uh 
they went in and they they raised the lot rents. The, the lot rents were 35% below average for the area. So they raised the lot rents uh, about 17%. So not a huge increase considering how far they were below value. They also passed the water and sewer back to the tenants. They started cleaning up the park. They you know, improved the management, decreased costs, increased marketing, started to fill uh, started the process of filling vacant lots with mobile homes and they sold this remember 7.1 million the week COVID started February 20th 2020 uh, sold it 10 months later December 20th 2020 for 15 million dollars that was a 347 percent IRR now I'm really familiar with that part because I went there as part of the due diligence I was involved in it other parks, you know, don't do as well as that, but that's the same type of process our operating partners and a lot of operators use when they buy a mobile home park. And so um, mobile home parks have uh, incredible, one thing I won't get into too much tonight, but they have incredible uh, accelerated depreciation opportunities. And one of the reasons is again, Mostly what they're leasing is infrastructure. The value of the land is typically like 25%. The value of the infrastructure uh, is about 75%. And most of that can be accelerated on the depreciation schedules they have now. So that's something you can ask me more about later if you wish. Now, why do we like RV parks? I wanted to invest in RV parks for years. In the lower left corner here, uh, that cabin there, that's the type of cabins we built. They were modular, I should say, but they, we, we brought them on site um, in Watford City, North Dakota, 13, no, 12 years ago for the Bakken oil boom. And we set up a, um, a housing facility there for oil executives, managers, workers who were coming to the Bakken oil boom. But our, so we learned a little bit about RV parks then, and I always knew I wanted to invest in them, but I had no idea how they would explode with COVID. The reason we didn't invest in RV parks for years is we couldn't find a great owner operator because there are not that many out there. There's not that great, that many great professionals out there, but we did find one and I'll touch on that briefly later. So why do we like RV parks? Well, there's a rapidly growing demand far ahead of supply. The pandemic has accelerated this long-term trend. It's highly fragmented mostly mom and pop owners. Uh, it's recession resistant, did really well during the GFC and great financial crisis and, and even much better since COVID. Uh, some of you might have RVs or you might have rented one. Provides a safe and affordable vacation, long runway for growth. Uh, here's some downsides to RV parks. I'm specifically talking here about the destination parks. Parks like this that have a whole lot of amenities. I'm gonna show you some amenities later. Um, but uh, the barriers to entry are lower than mobile home parks. It's really hard to build a new mobile home park. Uh, there's supply chain issues, just like other stuff going on right now. There's inflation. Uh, they're not always 100% pandemic proof. California actually uh, shut down RV parks briefly uh, in the first months of COVID, which we were surprised at. Uh, there's potential permitting delay, permitting delays. There's labor shortages, material shortages, things like that. So we don't want to make, you know, mobile home parks and RV parks look like they're all rosy. There's downsides to everything. But here's some powerful stats about RV parks. RV park ownership, RV ownership, I should say, has risen to 62% in about 22 years. A record 11.2 million U.S. households own an RV. But get this, 9.6 million more say they want to buy one in the next three or four years. 26% of campers were new to camping during the pandemic in 2020 alone. The rate of new campers grew five times higher than any pre previous uh, year uh, in 2020. Between 2019 and 2020, 6 million households started camping. KOA advanced deposits in 2022 were up 63% over 2019 levels. And one of the things people love about RV park camping is 
uh, that it's much more cost effective than traditional vacations. I'm not saying it's going to do perfect during a recession, but it might do better in some places. Somebody, somebody might not be able to afford to go to, to Disney World, but they might, you know, be willing to spend 47% less to do a um, RV, 47% uh, less than a car hotel vacation or 62% less than a comparable air hotel vacation. Uh, RV parks, uh, just, I mean, you can look around and see the increase in RV ownership and usage. Now, here's something interesting. On this last slide, I said 9 million people want to buy an RV. The maximum pro production every year is a little over 600,000. We're at record levels lately, but that is probably not going to materialize. And so you might think, well, that's maybe a downside to RV park investing. Well, it could be, but in a minute, I'm going to tell you something that's quite powerful. You might have already caught on to this. Um, this slide shows that RV parks in the top gray bar compared to these other four asset types that are compared here uh, was the only one that didn't dip into the negative uh, revenue growth range during the great financial crisis. It's the only one that stayed above the red line. Mobile home parks did as well. I wish they would have compared those on here. They didn't. <clears throat> 2018. Now, this is a graph I found online. They were already having a lot of trouble. A lot of people were having a hard time finding a campsite. My neighbor has a beautiful, I don't know what it costs, two, three hundred thousand dollars, one of those, you know, beautiful RVs. He says it's very, very hard to find an RV park site now. In fact, he has to reserve like a year, a year and a half out. Uh, if you want to get an RV uh, site this summer, you might have already missed your chance in many, many cases. And so the point of this is that we've even back in 2018, before COVID, uh, it was hard to find an RV site for a lot of people. Now, I was really concerned about gas miles. When gas skyrocketed last spring, especially out in California, Dimitri, I was like thinking, well, is our, our RVs going to be okay? Well, I was surprised that the gas mileage isn't quite as bad as I thought. Class A, 7 to 13 miles per gallon. Class B, 18 to 25. Class C, 14 to 18 miles per gallon. Now, my Toyota Sequoia gets 13 to 17 miles per gallon. Worse gas mileage than two of these types of RVs. I don't know. Maybe I should trade in my Sequoia and drive an RV around town. I don't know. But the budget, the cost of gas isn't as serious as I would have thought. And the average RV trip, from what I understand, is typically within two to three hours of folks' home. Now, one of the big reasons we love investing in RV parks right now is this, we have seen literally the first in 6,000 years of recorded earth history, we've seen something that's never happened before. And of course we know what that is, it's the remote work revolution. 58% of US job holders can work remotely now, at least part of the time. 35% work remotely full-time. And so this, and then the things that happen with COVID, people agonizing over their family, people realizing they could work effectively, not in the office, people realizing the importance of family, the shortness of life, the possibility that, you know, they, they saw people around them dying or potentially dying. A lot of people said, you know what, I'm going to go and do something that I want to do. I'm going to go out and buy an RV. I'm going to rent an RV. I'm going to do something with my family. And a lot of people did that. And so this confluence of this remote work revolution, uh, COVID, um, the possibility of renting RVs has really come together and created a tremendous opportunity. So this first in world history we're talking about. So this is my friend, Chad. Chad bought this RV for $48,000 used what he told me at least, it looks like a nice one. He spent about $30,000 outfitting it. I'm gonna show you the inside. So Chad is the CEO of a tech startup in Virginia. 
he decided he wanted to hit the road. So his, his startup's going pretty well. So he bought a couple motorcycles, bought some mountain bikes, and he outfitted the inside of his RV with drop-down desks. These are the desks. He can stand and work at these two standing desks. He's got a, a girlfriend that travels the country with him. And this is office mode. And this is garage mode. You can see the desks are elevated on cables up to the ceiling. He puts all his stuff inside and he heads to the next location. So I'm not saying a whole bunch of people are doing this, but I know that some are, and it's causing a significant increase in usage for RV parks. Hey, some people even live in their RVs. Okay, enough Christmas vacation jokes. Hopefully you like that. I um, actually have uh, Paul, one of the attendees who lives full full time in RV. Join yeah, us. Well, hopefully it's not Eddie's RV, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, that, that's great to know. Well, I mean, I love that. And I got to say, I got to say, I've got four kids and three are out of the house now. But I mean, I, I wish I wish we had done that. I, I, I kind of regret that we didn't do that when the kids were younger. Um, we homeschooled our kids. We could have done it. And that's going to be a regret I have for, you know, probably forever that we didn't do that. And I, I think people are starting to see that more and do that more now. That's really cool to hear that. What's the impact of Airbnb on the hotel business? Look at this. Airbnb is a basic, basically just beyond a startup. They're only 15 years old, yet they have about five times as many hotel rooms as the world's largest hotel chain. Excuse me, five times as many rooms or units. Marriott, almost a hundred year old chain, and Airbnb is already about five times larger. And I think this is even outdated. And um, so Airbnb has had a huge impact on the hotel business. Um, Uber has had an incredible impact on the taxi business. We even use Uber as a verb now. You know, I'll, I'll Uber over to your house. Uh, you can rent cars. You can, uh, through Turo, I did that on vacation once. You can rent boats. You can rent tools. And ladies, no, I shouldn't have said ladies, but the website I went to called Tillery even rents clothes. And that kind of grossed me out, but that's another story. <laughs> anyway, RV share, outdoorsy, and other uh, RV sharing sites are revolutionizing the RV world. Because now anybody who has an RV, RVs sit an average of 48 to 49 weeks a year. They sit in someone's yard or someone's garage or someone's you know, rental space. Well, now those same folks can turn those into rolling rental units. In fact, I know a lady named Whitney Hutton. Dimitri, I think you know her too. She bought an RV in Colorado about a year ago and she spent $80,000 on it. And she, she made $40,000 net in six months six months um just this year and so it's a very powerful um it's a new a powerful innovation in the rv world but think about where the pressure is going for this it's going on rv parks now i want to talk about wheelbase more in a moment but the impact on rv parks and investors i, I would say is nothing short of staggering so we've got this remote work revolution We've got the increase in people wanting to get away, getting outdoors, and now we've got the chance to rent an RV. But I was worried when I went to, I wanted to rent an RV this year, okay? And I was worried. I was like, what are the risks? What, what, what if they get in an accident? How do, can I even get insurance? Can I get insurance as a rookie on a long weekend? What, what if it breaks down? I, I'm, I'm intimidated about driving this large rig. I mean, my wife, my wife was, you know. Dimitri. Um, I'm concerned about the setup. How do I hook up the sewer and the water and the electricity? I mean, my wife was worried about that, you know. But uh, what, you know, what, what's the answer to all this? Well, the answer is RV Share, Outdoorsy, and Wheelbase have got this all covered. They've got insurance. They've got maintenance services, 24-hour helplines. If you get in trouble, they'll send somebody out to fix it, to tow you, to do whatever. And they'll even set up your RV at your site. If you're renting an RV, 
and you're fortunate enough to get an RV site, you can actually rent, you can actually pay wheelbase to come and set up the RV and clean it and set it up for you. And you just have to, you can show up in your car if you choose to. So I thought you guys might want to know this. There's four types of RV parks that I'm aware of. There's overnight and campground parks, extended stay, workforce, and destinations. So cover this real quick. Overnight campgrounds, these are typically uh, heavy on convenience and light on amenities. They're typically, you know, a place to stop on the way somewhere. So that would be an overnight campground RV park. There's also the extended stay. You've seen these. These are the permanent placement types. Like, I'm, I, I, I'm kind of embarrassed to tell you this, but my cousins actually outfitted an old school bus and put it in an RV park, and they they vacationed there for years. And uh, you know, it had a deck on it, and it had you know a patio, and all that was set up. So this is an extended stay RV park. Now, don't laugh at these because I'm here at Smith Mountain Lake in Virginia, and um, it's that's near my home. And my friend owns an RV park there. He says he collects, uh, he's got a year's waiting list and he collects all the rent for the whole year before the year starts. The, the tenants have to commit by October for the following year and they have to be fully paid in full by April for, the, for that next year. So it's pretty good cash flowing business there. Um, workforce. Not real common. These are, you know, RV parks for workers. Like I, I told you about setting those up in North Dakota. This is actually an indoor RV park in Watford City, North Dakota. Um, and that was for the, to brave the terrible cold there. And there's destination RV parks. Now this is the one I really like because the barriers to entry here are huge. The park is the destination. The park, the RV park itself, I mean, let's put it this way. We, we invested in one uh, of these. We, in fact, invested in this one in Leesburg, Alabama. And if I got the numbers right, it was three and a half million dollars to acquire the park, and about fourteen or fifteen million in capital expenses to improve it. All types of, you know, pools, water parks, swimming, fishing lakes, pay rides, trails, you know, face painting, gem mining, um, you know, and wibbits. Now, who knows what Wibbits is? I'm going to tell you what Wibbits is. That's this. This is a Wibbit. A Wibbit is a floating obstacle course. Now, this my wife and I went to this RV park in, near Fort Worth, Texas, as part of our due diligence to invest with this company. And they were showing me this lake. It was about a six hundred thousand dollar lake and beach they had set up, but. They also spent 200,000 or so on these wibbits, this floating obstacle course, and they rent this for 16 or $17 per, per hour, per kid in the summer, and they're making $1,000 an hour from this, this wibbit thing in the height of the summer. So very, very nice value add. So I'm gonna tell you quickly about this RV park operator. We're getting out of time here. So I can just tell you they buy these RV parks, they renovate them, they upgrade them, they bring in new management, they do aggressive marketing, uh, they bring in, you know, they have civil engineers, they do a ton of upgrades, and they're expecting cash flow, this is just projected, it's not guaranteed at all, of mid-teens or higher <clears throat> after a couple years, mid-teens or higher cash flow at the asset level, high IRR projections as well. So these are some of the revenue enhancement opportunities. We've got golf cart rental, patio sites, doggy pens. They, they, they put dog pens up there and they rent them for like $50 a night. I mean, think of the, think of the return on investment of a $1,200 dog pen uh, that they rent for 50 or 60 a night. They've got part models, glamping units, food service, paid activities, all kinds of stuff. This is a $2.3 million water park in the upper left corner here. Uh, there's the dog pen I mentioned down here in the in the upper middle. There, they have food services, wibbits, all kinds of stuff. You can't beat wibbits, Dimitri. Uh, one thing they do is, this one is one we invested in in Branson, Missouri. It's uh, They bought a small park, but they were able to, for a pretty low price, buy the land nearby it and expand. And so 
if you can do that, <clears throat> you can add, you know, internet services. I mean, you can, you know, you can provide a place for, you know, people can work out of their RV while the kids are having a blast. And so, and this is the one in Leesburg, Alabama, we showed you, and this is one in Branson, Missouri. Very excited about uh, investing in RV parks. Now, <clears throat> I mentioned earlier Michelangelo, kind of quirky, uh, mentioned intrinsic value. I mentioned the possibility of extracting intrinsic value to create wealth. I want to show you this. On the right side here, multifamily ownership, 93% of multifamily uh, assets over 50 units are owned by corporations who have already typically you know, gotten the value. They've already done the value adds and they've already extracted that value. But look at the middle here, mobile home park ownership, 90%, up to 90% of mobile homes are still owned by mom and pop operators. Acquiring one of these and paying them a very fair price can allow you as an investor or an operator who has the skills to do this, to turn it into a professionally run, professionally managed a company, and then putting a lot of those together in a portfolio <clears throat> can actually bring a premium. So it's widely known that if you put together a portfolio of similar assets with similar management, with similar systems, great marketing, great websites, you can get a better price because you can find an institutional buyer, kind of like we showed Blackstone earlier, you know, buying a portfolio of these homes or people like Sam Zell buying a portfolio of these, I didn't mean homes, I meant assets. So wonderful opportunity to extract value and create a better property, create a better living situation for the people and overall a great return for investors. John D. Rockefeller said, I'd rather earn 1% off 100 people's efforts than 100% of my own efforts. One of our investors, when the light bulb went off for them, they were, she was in Europe trying to figure out how to find single family homes in the US. And she said, wait a minute, why? Why should I work harder than I need to, to make less than I could? Before we wrap up, I wanna, oh, I, here's, here's a couple, I forgot I had this on here. Here's a couple ways to reach out to us. You can take a screenshot of this if you like, if you would like a free special report on uh, mobile home park investing, you can get that at wellingscapital.com slash resources. And within about two weeks, we're going to have an RV park special report finished. If you would like to get a copy of that RV park special report completely free, you can just email us at info at wellingscapital.com or you can email Alyssa at wellingscapital.com. I got to talk about one more thing, Dimitri. Did you know if you took the record profits, not the average, the record profits of Apple, General Motors, Nike, and Starbucks, added those record profits together and doubled that number, that would be the approximate annual profits from human trafficking, according to the U.S. State Department. It's, it's an incredible uh, thing. It's, uh, slavery is the highest level in world history right under our noses. And so Wellings Capital is donating. We're, we're getting involved. The issue is huge. Uh, and the problem for us who want to get involved is we don't know what to do. I mean, what, what do I do? Do we, do we go on a SWAT raid in Cambodia or do we send money to somebody we don't really know? What we've done is just like we find Wellings Capital has tried to solve for this for commercial real estate, we're, we're trying to solve for the human trafficking issue by doing due diligence and finding the best organizations we can that we trust. We send them money. We have actually raised $280,000 in the last 14 months since Giving Tuesday in 2021. Uh, we've raised $280,000. Our goal is to free 5,000 slaves in the next five years. Our partner is AIM aimfree.org and if you would like to contact them you can just go right there aimfree.org you can learn more you can get involved you can participate in ending this great evil if you want to chat with us uh, you can set up you can use this calendly link you can email us and like i said you can get 
those resources. Here are the footnotes for some of the RV park stats. And I am ready, if you are, Dimitri, to answer some questions. Okay, Paul, thanks so much. Uh, a lot of information, a lot of great information. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, everybody for sticking with us uh, till this uh, moment. And yes, we do have a few questions. So if you guys have another question for Paul, go ahead and type uh, your question in a Q&A and I'll read that for Paul. But uh, uh, first question, what are the risks investing in RV parks? And also uh, risk investing in mobile home parks? Yeah. Um... So the mobile home park, I think the biggest risk is uh, public, bad publicity. There have been a couple mobile home park operators, one in New York in particular, who have just dramatically like gone in and doubled lot rents the day they bought the facility. Just not good. It's not right. And that's not a right way to treat people. And it got some really bad press. It caused some, you know, uh, it caused rent uh, it, it caused rental increase restrictions. Um, and so I think just bad press and I think eviction moratoriums, that would be in the mobile home park space. In the RV park space, I think, you know, I mean, a lot of these RV parks are really rural. It means the land is pretty cheap. I mean, you can buy rural land in Virginia for $1,500 an acre. Well, if you can create a rural RV park there, um, you can compete with somebody else. So the, the risk of competition would be one of the biggest ones in RV parks. And um, I think that I think those would be the biggest risk. Sure. Uh, Bennett asking, uh, what are your thoughts on RV storage business? I think it's a fabulous business. Uh, my friend in Colorado has looked into that. And he hasn't pulled the trigger on it yet, but I think it's a great business. I think if you can find, if you can get a piece of inexpensive rural land, uh, gravel it, possibly add electricity in certain cases, you know, to keep them warm in cold climates, um, I think it could be a great business. I don't really know about the economics, but we do invest heavily in self storage. And uh, for example, in Colorado Springs, we have um, a, a property that um, was acquired for 10.9 million in 2019. And the value now is about, uh, last I checked was about 20 million. And uh, there's a lot of RV park and boat, outdoor boat storage there, and that's working out real well. 